Patriot Network TV. This is number two of three on gun control and my reaction to the Connecticut situation. I immediately thought of one of my favorite dramatic portrayals of social responsibility, which is a man for all seasons. And Sir Thomas More is caught up in the machinations of the king. And for those of you who don't know this story, you can go rent the movie, you can get it from Netflix. And A Man for All Seasons is one of the great, great moral episodes in the history of England. And it also will tell you the story of the birth of the Church of England and how the English monarch broke from the Roman Pope and blah, blah, blah. There's a whole series of things about it. But at one point, Sir Thomas More, who has been a close friend of the king, close personal friend for a long, long time, More has the epiphany. He comes to understand that even though he's friends with the king and even though he loves the king and the king is his deep and good personal friend, he loves God more. He loves justice more. He loves the reality of his soul more than he loves the temporal satisfaction of breathing another day. And there's this wonderful interchange between one of the prosecutors and more. And if, if you, you can go see the play Death in the Abbey, you can, you can watch A Man for All Seasons, but this play boils down to really this moment. The prosecutor is talking about what he would do to get to the devil. And Moore asks him, what would you do? Cut a great road through the laws to get after the devil? And the prosecutor replies, yes, I would cut down every law in England to do that. Now, the short dramatic answer is, and then, Mr. Prosecutor, when the winds of injustice blow from the mouth of the devil, where will you find safety? The way Moore answers it in A Man for All Seasons is to say, oh, and when the last law was cut down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide? Prosecutor, the laws have all been flattened. The country is planked thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's laws. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, Mr. Prosecutor, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds of injustice that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. Well, folks, the winds of injustice are blowing right now, right here in this country. And they're blowing from the mouths of people who pretend to believe in the rule of law, but they don't. They don't believe in the U.S. Constitution. The current president of the United States has defined repeatedly the U.S. Constitution as a charter of negative rights. The president of the United States has spoke at great length about how the founders of this country were immoral men and they were not possessed of a moral view. The, f the current president of the United States has said things that just a few years ago would have disqualified you from being a dog catcher or working at the local post office. But now the president can say pretty much anything he wants to and no one is going to stand up to him. The winds of injustice are blowing. If you cut down every tree in the forest of law, when those winds of injustice blow from the mouth of the devil, where will you seek refuge? Without the U.S. Constitution, without the Declaration of Independence, without the Second Amendment, are you going to trust these people who speak constantly of revoking your First and Second Amendment rights. Speak constantly about the limits on your speech. Speak constantly about the limits on your right to keep and bear arms. Speak constantly about how you have oppressed others and you are a bad example of what we have in mind. Are you going to trust those people? I certainly don't. And I was empowered by the founders who in their infinite wisdom understood that the winds of injustice are always blowing. I went back and looked at a couple of references to one of my favorite black Americans, a former U.S. Marine who went back to the South after serving honorably in the U.S. Marine Corps and fought the KKK. 
And he didn't fight him with harsh language. He didn't fight him in court. He went to the houses of the ministers who were under attack by the KKK. And keep in mind, the Ku Klux Klan was a wholly owned subsidiary of the Democratic Party. There was no difference in the South in the 19, from 1900 to 1970. In the South, the KKK was the Democrat Party. When they buried Senator Byrd, Clinton, former president of the United States, got up and said, yeah, he was a, yeah, he was a grand dragon, he was a Klegel, he was a fundraiser, he was in the Klan. That's what a guy had to do back then. To, be, to get into the Democrat Party, you had to be a member of the Klan. Well, let me tell you what black Americans did in the South to defend themselves from the Klan. They didn't go to the county sheriff. They didn't go to the Democrat Party because the Democrat Party was the Klan. You know what they did? They went to the gun store. And they took the skills, this former Marine that I'm referring to, took the skills that he learned in the U.S. Marine Corps, and he dug in. He bought his ammo cans full of 5.56 NATO, got his AR-15 assault weapon, dug in in front of the minister's home, and when the KKK showed up, guess what? He shot that weapon. He enforced justice out of the barrel of a gun. When the winds of injustice blew from the KKK, Strong, brave black Americans stood with their weapons and said, get the hell off my property. The essence of the Second Amendment is to empower the weakest members of society not to be victimized by the strongest. It is laughable that no matter how many failures the left has with gun control, Oh, this is a gun-free zone. Oh, this is a gun-free city. Oh, this is a gun-free... Forget that. Forget that. Chicago's got some of the harshest gun laws on earth. Has it stopped the crime? Black on black crime in Chicago? Gun crime? No. Nolens, harsh gun laws, high murder rate. Washington, D.C., harsh gun laws, high murder rate. Now, of course, the excuse of the left is, well, if we could just get all the guns. Let me tell you, even our enemies in World War II were bright enough to understand that they couldn't invade the United States. What did the Japanese High Command say? We can't invade the American homeland. Behind every blade of grass would be an American with a rifle. And you know something? Our enemies in World War II know us better than the American left does today. You come to take my weapon away, you're in trouble. You're in horrible trouble. What caused this horrible, evil tragedy in Connecticut. It's got nothing to do with honest, law-abiding gun owners like myself. And it has nothing to do, it is not an argument, to take away my Second Amendment right of the people to keep and bear arms. And if you want to take that away, you are up against the wall. Because that is a God-given right. That is a right that we hold this truth to be self-evident, that we are endowed by our Creator with that right. And nobody has the right to proceed or prevent my ownership of guns. Now, I have a couple of safes at the house. They're full of weapons. I've never shot anybody for any reason. If you came to harm my family, I'd shoot you dead in a second. Every weapon I have, I know how to use. I've trained with it. I love shooting them. They're very, very enjoyable. I've got a beautiful Ruger Super Red Hawk. It was a gift from my wife. It's a wonderful weapon. Just a great weapon. I've got boxes and boxes of black Talon ammunition. These are great bullets because the head, the actual bullet itself, separates out into razor sharp particles and slices to shreds whoever you aim at. And if you break into my house to harm my family, to harm my wife, to harm my daughter, to harm me, you're going to get these at about 1,800 foot per second. And it's not going to be any fun for you. Now, I'm not going to enjoy it either. It'll, I'll probably get sued. I'll probably have to go through all kinds of litigation. But I have a right to self-defense. Now, at the same trip that I was picking up my little DPS MS AR-15 5.56 NATO, I noticed these other weapons. Now, are you telling me that at 6'2 and 270, with this knife in my hand, I couldn't walk into a school and kill 20 people 
or 30 people or 50 people or walk into a movie theater and kill 30 people? Are you telling me that you can make everybody safe? I got bad news for you folks. Life is fatal. You protect people by arming them, not by disarming them. Alrighty, we've got one more segment in this little learning session. We'll do that next. God bless you and God bless the United States.